Uh, welcome. I am Tom Waltice, the director of Geneva Campus Ministry, and thank you for coming out as well. Uh, after my introduction, and maybe while Sarah is just beginning, uh, the assistant director, Matt Moore, is going to be passing out just little white squares of paper. We would like to know who's here. We won't bug you too much. You might get emails from us a little bit. We'll warn you about that. Uh, but we like to know who comes, so we'd like to get your name and email information. If you have comments or questions, we won't collect them until the end, in other words, so you can write things down. Uh, after the presentation, we hope to have uh, some time of question and answer uh, as well. Um, there are many things that can be talked about, and I'm sure not everything is going to be covered as well. But this is the 93rd Geneva Lecture. My wife asked me to count how many there have been since 1976. Uh, and that's pretty impressive. This is the 93rd. Uh, and we thank the University of Iowa that has partnered with us in this one and many other times, especially in the use of this facility. We're not sure yet if air conditioning has been turned on for the spring yet. So it's a little warm in here, but as you walked in, you realized it was warmer out there. So it's a little better in here at least. So uh, back in the 1980s when I was beginning pastoral ministry, the church I was serving hosted a presentation by a Christian uh, scientist there. You got to be careful how you say that, uh, but a Christian who is a scientist. Uh, some, a few might recognize the name here, many won't, but uh, Dr. Howard Ventil. Because then, back in the mid-1980s, there was a huge controversy. On, he had written a book about um, astronomy and the age of the Earth and, and the formation of stars. And that caused a controversy. The book was called The Fourth Day. And so the church I was part of said, we need to have a way to address this as opposed to people writing letters, making angry comments. It was pre-social media, so it wasn't as nasty as it can get today. Uh, but unfortunately, too often, these discussions don't become discussions. They become accusations and arguments and become very unhealthy very quickly. One comment I remember from that presentation, somebody said to me that too often these kind of discussions generate more heat than light. They are heated discussions, but not enlightening. We hope to change that today, at least take a step in a better direction with Dr. Sarah Bodvile Rules leading us. In discussions leading up to this ad uh, address, we had a lot of things on how can we go at this? And so much of our marketing says, we want to deal with the evolution question some, uh, but Dr. Bodbow says, there's some bigger issues of how to deal with this question than just dealing with the direct issues. And she's going to be looking at some of those larger context issues for how the discussion is handled or could be handled and how Christianity could become part of a healthier discussion on the relationship between science or society and faith, all mixed together into a healthier discussion. Uh, we at Geneva, one of our taglines is that we are Christian exploration at the University of Iowa. I like that, I, that word, I picked it, so I did like it. Uh, that idea of being an exploration, the sense of searching, of looking, and asking questions. And so I hope this will be a good step in that exploration. We value the exploration of science, and so we want to make that very clear. This is not to say against science. This is very much valuing science. How can we enter into this partnership, this dialogue, this discussion? Science does an excellent job offering answers to what questions, sometimes how questions. What we often say that at Geneva, we, we want our students also to look at the why questions. Not just cause and effect why, but in terms of purpose, meaning. Or for those of you, and I see my philosopher friend in the front row, the teleological questions uh, as well. And so we hope that this will be an exploration for you. Stimulate your thinking in different directions. Stimulate ways to have healthy discussion. 
uh, here with your friends here, among other people as well that you may encounter, to celebrate the wonders of how God works in the world, in science and through the faith community as well. So we expect that Dr. Sarah Bodbile Rules will help us in this mission. She is an emerging significant voice in the te teaching of science and in the discussion of the relationship between science and society. She is one of the spokesperson for a organization called BioLogos, which is a Christian organization founded by Dr. Francis Collins. Some of you might recognize the name. He uh, was a significant player in the DNA research. Uh, and after doing that, he said, we have to find a way to foster a better discussion between the Christian faith tradition in the sciences. And so Sarah is also part of that organization and working with them, as well as holding her new full-time position at the Colorado Schools of Mine, where she is uh, working very much in helping teachers teach better in the area of sciences especially. We also doc listed Dr. Steve Rules as a partner uh, in this discussion. He will not be doing the presentation here today. Uh, he will be doing one this evening at St. Andrew Presbyterian Church at 6.30. Uh, he is a partner with Sarah as uh, husband and wife partner, but also in research, also being a PhD in biology. Um, and I also highlight him a little bit because I'm proud to say he's my nephew. So uh, a slight connection there as well. Um, as I say, I think Matt and Marissa passed out those white sheets. If you would fill them out sometimes, we'll collect them afterwards. If you want to put a question on the back, because you don't feel comfortable asking that in public, I'll try to collect them in the question and answer period, or Matt will, and uh, we can use those questions as well. We'll also take questions from you uh, directly if you have them. So it is a privilege for me to welcome Steve and Sarah here, but especially Sarah, as she presents to help us have a healthy discussion on the relationship of science and society. Perfect. Okay, so I want to begin again by thanking Tom Waltheis and Matt Moore of the Geneva Campus Ministry and also Mike Daly, who's back there somewhere, professor of biology here at University of Iowa, for their invitation and hospitality. And I'm looking forward to being on the campus more tomorrow. Um, I also want to acknowledge the organization BioLogos, which Tom talked about briefly, um, which you'll hear more about also in my talk, which co-sponsored this session. Um, and I also want to thank you for being here on a Sunday afternoon and especially kind of broiling in this room um, to consider the incredibly important topic of divisiveness in today's society, specifically around science and how perhaps counterintuitively Christianity and other religious traditions may provide unique opportunities to heal societal divisions. So the first thing I want to do in this room is create a little bit of division among you. Because I know this is a very friendly crowd and you're friendly to me and each other and probably many of you know each other. And in your mind you can say, yeah, society is really divisive and there's lots of polarizing issues, but not here. We're a safe space. And I kind of want to show you how easy it is to become divisive. So does anybody remember the dress? OK, I'm getting some nods. All right, so this is something that floated around on social media on 2015 and is going to be the way that we are going to show some divisiveness in this room. So people see this dress in different ways. I'm going to have you guys vote. If you see this dress, this image on the screen of a dress, as a white and gold dress, raise your hand. And look around you as you do. Okay. So what do you see on the screen? White and gold, raise your hand. We've only got a few people, there's a minority here, that see it as white and gold. All right, how many people see it as blue and black? Raise your hand and look around. How many people see it as blue and black? Okay, that's really interesting. We have more of a majority here than I often see in crowds. Does anyone not see it as either one of those two colors and see it something else like brown or shades of brown? Sir, what do you see? Just yell it out. Blue and gold. Okay, blue and gold. Okay. Any other, anybody else? Blue and brown. Blue and brown. Okay. So this was interesting because some people see it one way, some people say, see it the other. If I told you this dress is actually 
actually, oh, you know what? That might actually change it. Let me move the lights a second. Oh no, I'm not gonna do that, it's fine. We still got a diverse, diverse uh, audience answer. So if this dress, if I told you it was actually blue and black, what does that make you think? The majority wins, right? You're like, yeah, we got it right. And what about the people who saw it as white and gold? Can you look at that now and say, oh yeah, I totally see blue and black. Yeah, you were right all along. <laughs> right? I see it as white and gold too. Even if it is not my experience to see this as black and blue and somebody tells me that's the truth, it does not change my experience of this thing. And it doesn't mean that in some way there may not be value to what I'm seeing. So that's our first mini lesson on divisiveness, is that not, every, not everything is black and white, right and wrong, black and blue. So let's scale this up a little bit and think about bigger problems. Here's a picture that I use to represent poverty. The dress is a very simple, it's either this color or it's not, because it's a photo of an actual dress. You can look at the colors if you take away the photo. This, however, is an issue on an indeterminate scale, poverty. How do you solve poverty? Is there a right way to solve poverty? By, by moving resources certain ways? There's so many trade-offs, there's so many possibilities, and attempting to solve poverty in a place like Alabama, even, might be very different than trying to solve poverty in Namibia. And so you can imagine when all these different perspectives and differing interests versus corporations versus NGOs versus missions groups try to do this type of work, there's a lot of entanglement here. And this isn't even something we often get divided about. Everybody agrees that we would like to reduce poverty, right? But still how we go about it is extraordinarily challenging. So this brings us to what poverty is a representation of when we're thinking of divisive and polarizing problems, which is the wicked problem. You may have heard that terminology before. There's tame problems like the dress, which actually have a solution that you can come to. And there are wicked problems, which have these characteristics to them, which are really, really challenging to address because they might have incomplete or contradictory knowledge. You don't know everything about the situation. There's lots of people and decision making involved, like the NGOs versus the corporations versus personal interests versus community interests. They're interconnected with other problems, right? If you throw all your resources at poverty, which part of poverty are you going for? Are you going for like a social justice angle? Are you going to how you're going to feed people, how you get them into gainfully employed jobs? It's pretty complex. Um, there's often a large economic burden to these decisions that's often carried inequally among groups of people. And the big point here is that these problems tend to move beyond the scientific facts themselves and move into the social realm where there are values and ethics and morals all attached to these things that change kind of the decision space when you're trying to solve these issues. So once information moves from that scientific realm to society, there's this shift. And other significant challenges um, definitely come in. So what data should be used? Um, looking at these examples of science and society, you all recognize these, because these are kind of the big bugaboos in society right now, right? And some of them you can say, oh, well maybe this is a religious problem. Religious folks might have trouble with integrating evolution. Or maybe religious people seem to be the most resistant to things like gender and sexuality. Maybe even climate change, right? But some of the other ones are harder to define. What about reproductive rights? Is that actually a religious issue within the US or are there other factors there? What about gun control? It feels automatically like you can parse these into, oh, well, this group of people thinks that. Oh, this group of think people thinks that. But it's a little bit more complex, I think. And so one kind of hypothesis that I want to pose is that, again, when information moves from the sciences, which we're going to pretend are a little bit more objective than they are, but some type of fact, some piece of data moves from science into society, there's a communication breakdown there. And those facts become co-opted into people's agendas 
and become entangled with morals and values. And then the same thing happens when it kind of kicks back to science. There might be this kind of communication issue between these two spheres. And so we'll just call that our lack of communication hypothesis for now. So how do we address this hypothesis and try to figure out where the basis of division in our societies is really occurring? For you, it was as simple as whether or not you could see the colors of a dress. But it's got to be bigger than that, right? So there's a few people who research this very specific thing, including this guy, Dan Kahan, who is at Yale University. And he's written a number of papers in this area, but I'm going to focus on some of his findings from this extraordinarily titled piece on the sources of ordinary science knowledge and extraordinary science ignorance. So the first thing Dan points out is that science really has issue bias in society. So looking around, how many of you really rely on or appreciate the fact that we can have better living through chemicals now? AKA many of the medications that are either therapeutic or preventative that we can use to you know, enhance our lives and make us more comfortable. Most of the time we take on that stuff wholesale. Plus, I also see people taking notes on some cell phones or checking some stuff on cell phones. Those are an extraordinarily powerful piece of technology. And most of the time, we just grab the apps and don't care who's listening to our, inf um, you know, our information and what we're giving up, and we just use them wholesale. There's so many pieces of science and technology that improve our lives that we just have no issue with. Of, and um, oh, another great one that comes to mind is every time a study comes out on chocolate, right? Is chocolate good for you? Is chocolate bad for you? <laughs> yes, no, <laughs> right? And that seems to switch like every few weeks. So people think the science is different and you, know, you just kind of buy in wholesale what you want to hear. However, there are a few things like those uh, few tiles a couple slides ago, like evolution, climate change, genetically modified organisms that we really think are a big deal for some reason. Why is that? Okay, so first, issue bias. Second, public anti-science sentiment. All right, so we all think that perhaps the United States is getting more leery of science, right? That's something you've probably heard in the news. As a scientist, that's something I hear all the time where it's like, man, our image isn't so great. How do we talk to people to make them think we're not horrible um, and that we're trustworthy? Well, it turns out lots of people are trying to um, assay this in some way. And so the National Science Foundation has sent out multiple survey items about this type of thing to see what the temperature really is like in the United States around science. So first, does the government spend too much or too little on science? This graph shows that from 1980 to 2015 of doing this survey, more people think that the government spends too little on science. And you know the government spends millions of dollars, billions of dollars on science every year, right? And so this might be a little bit surprising. It's like, okay, well maybe science in general is good. But what about that kind of science that doesn't really amount to anything? Kind of the basic research, is that worth funding to the public? Should scientific research that brings no immediate benefits be, for, be supported? Same thing, far more people, over three quarters of people surveyed said absolutely. Even researching the color of slime molds and why those arise doesn't really have anything to do with necessarily furthering the human race and that should be supported. So it turns out the public might not be actually all that anti-science. All right, so what about the religious folks? Right, that's what we hear, that it's religion versus science all the time. So let's look at those assumptions. First, are the benefits or harms of scientific research greater when you're talking to religious folks? If you put people on a scale of very low religiosity, generally self-identifying as atheists, so we go like atheist, maybe agnostic, you know, maybe religious, I'm devoutly religious, and then on this axis, the percentage of people who responded, you'll see that most people, 80%, regarding, I mean, regardless of religiosity, 70 to 80% think that the benefits of science are far outweighing the harms. And there's only a small percentage of people, somewhere between maybe 90% and 100%, so 
10% of folks, regardless of re re religiosity, that say that the harms of scientific research might be greater. So this is also interesting and different from what we believe, right? Because you'd expect to see this line maybe drop off here so that highly religious folks might not think there's as much of a benefit to science. And this does include all science, not just like medical science. So this one's really fun. Our last assumption to look at is education because everybody thinks the way to solve some of these problems is just to educate, 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 right? You go out with your flyers, you say, this is really like the truth about this subject. It's okay, it's not scary, join my side. It turns out that doesn't really work. So, and you should kind of know that from having conversations with your relatives who disagree with you, right? The more information you pound them with over the head, usually the worse the conversation goes. It's not like they go, oh yeah, you have all the facts, you're right. I'm gonna change my mind. So looking at climate change specifically and asking the question, is climate change due to human intervention? This survey was done in a way that they could, um, the uh, Dan's group, research group, could also get something that I'm just calling here an intelligence score, which is a combination of IQ and numeracy. So the better you are at math problems, the higher you score here. And this is a probability, there we go, thank you. If probability of answering yes or no. And so there's some error bars in here, which is why the lines are different thicknesses. But overall, it doesn't matter what level of education you have, you are equally likely to say yes or no, climate change is um, caused by humans. So the people in the survey were 50% likely to say one, 50% likely to say the other. It didn't matter how smart they were. But let's do something fun with this. What happens if we divide out the da data by political party? <laughs> Boom, huge difference, right? So in this case, if you are a liberal Democrat, you are more likely to say that climate change is human caused. If you are a conservative Republican, you are less likely to say that it's human caused. You'll say, no, it's not. And the really fun part about this graph is that the lines change slope. So the more educated you are or smarter you are, the more likely you are to be polarized and say yes or no, which is really fantastic. But, but what I wanna say here, this is not due to political party. Republicans are not necessarily the cause of division, neither are Democrats. Let me repeat that. <laughs> Political party is not necessarily the driver of division. Okay, now that we have that over, sorry, I did that intentionally. <laughs> um, but what does this mean? This, to me, is a signal of tribalism, which I think some of you have heard of, comes up in the news. Tribalism is effectively an individual's need to belong, to feel accepted, to be part of an in-group. And that's a great thing, but the problem with that is you also then create out-groups around you who are different from you, don't agree with you, can never be like you, and won't understand you, right? And so in this case, political party trumps the ability to get along, that was not intentional, <laughs> supersedes the ability to get along as as human beings and talk about this thing. And the fun part about it is, is the higher your intelligence score, the more able you are to rationalize your argument and use the facts that you know to make a coherent story for the position that you believe you should be in. So thinking about this, together we can think of our experiences with the dress at the beginning of the talk and consideration of what makes a wicked problem and our surprising findings about people's thoughts about science in the US to kind of create this new framework for what might cause polarization in society. So division arises as individuals interpret data through three major lenses. First, authority. Who do you consider to be an authority on a topic? Is it your friend? who may have an expertise in an area, so like in these types of things, maybe a scientist, a scientist at a university, 
a respected church leader, someone on media that you know through media sources that seems to be a credible person. Who that person is that you trust, that set of people, may radically change the way that you think about the world. Second, who do you identify with and what experiences have you had in life? The tribalism piece plus experience is huge. If you grow up on an Iowa corn farm in a family of farmers, you are going to have a different set of experiences and a different in-group than someone then grows up in New Delhi in the middle of an urban environment. And it has very much to do with just um, the making of your identity. And those two things may not allow you to talk together well. Um, and do you feel a need to align with a certain group of people, for instance, a political party? And critically, the last one, I think, is your value system, kind of this bottom one. Are you in it to win it? Are you a very entrepreneurial, heavy-duty business person who is really competitive in some areas and then maybe a great philanthropist in others? Do you prioritize social justice or philanthropy? Do you prioritize company profits or your retirement profits? Right? All of these little even individual decisions and values really can change who we are. And I haven't really even gotten into the religious ones yet. So superimposing that framework that we just tried to consider over the science meets society potential communication problem, we can consider which of these factors might be mutable, things that we can make a difference with. It's hard to change tribal affiliations and early experiences. It's very hard to download somebody else's memory into your brain, although that's coming. I have it from the top. And it's also really hard to change who you think of as an authority. Some of that's really fixed, and it should be, and that's OK. However, is there space to reevaluate our lack of communication between things like science and society and other things that drive divisiveness by focusing in on our value system? I propose there's an opportunity to bridge ideological divides by developing communication around shared values that can help us contribute to these conversations. So what do I mean by that, and what do I mean by shared values? Let's look at, back at some of these contentious issues. Even if you are sitting next to someone who has a completely opposite idea about how some of these sh things should be handled. So say you're an evolutionary biologist who supports mainstream science, and you are sitting next to someone who is a six-day creationist. So this one's kind of a problem. What are some shared values, specifically those that come out of religious traditions, and in my sense, Christianity, because it's what I know more about, that could be used to have a conversation that helps build commonalities so that we can move forward with a commonality? You feel like people are in your in-group before you start to make some decisions on what this might look like in policy and society. So some things I can think of off the top of my head are, OK, you're both Christians or you're both religious. So what about this huge history of talking about what it means to be in the image of God? What about shared values that we talk about all the time in church over hundreds of years of what it means to be a person? And that one certainly goes with this reproductive right one, rights one too. For conservation, how about figuring out together what we all want for the next generation? I don't think even the most I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here. Someone who is incredibly focused on immediate internal profits would really be pressed to say, no, I'm really in it to destroy the world so that my kids can't have a piece of the pie. Like, that's really not a thing, right? And so how do we have conversations that bring together what we want for our kids and what we want for earth keeping, especially bringing in some of the religious traditions around creation care and uh, what God said to Adam and Eve in the garden about taking care of creation. And there's those types of things that you can do almost with all of this, right? So how do you use shared values 
and make those connections with people before you tackle some of the big stuff. So you don't polarize as much and make them other. So I know that you're probably thinking at this point, well, great, Sarah's gonna tell us in two minutes how to do this and we'll have this great new thing to try out in society and we can solve all of our problems, yay! Yeah, of course I'm not gonna give you that because I don't actually know the answer either, but I actually think there's a lot of beauty in the struggle of trying to figure out what to do. So instead, I'm just going to offer you a few examples of where I see these types of conversations already happening and what they look like. Some of them at a national and international level and some of them even locally for you. So first, BioLogos. I'm representing BioLogos here tonight, so I have to talk about them a little bit. Um, this is a Christian organization founded by Dr. Francis Collins, who is the, um, the head of the National Institutes of Health, where lots and lots and lots of your tax money goes for science. Um, and he's also the one who was the head of the Human Genome Project, which Tom alluded to earlier. And so the way that we are able to now have the human genome sequenced and use incredible therapies to target uh, different genetic anomalies within humans is, um, is part of his work. He wrote this book up here called The Language of God, and that's what really started this organization. Um, the Language of God was his story of being a um, atheistic, maybe agnostic uh, doctor, and then having this interesting Christianity life conversion experience as a doctor after working with one of his um, terminal patients. And the book was him explaining how he went through this whole transformation and how he really saw no conflict between the science he was doing and faith, and then got deeper and deeper into it and was really interested in theology and the science and didn't see any argument. And so he wrote this book and then started getting thousands of emails from people who said, I'm so conflicted, I read your book, this is amazing, I have so many questions from you, for you. So just all these questions. And it was overwhelming and he said, well, I've got to do something about this. So he started this organization which specifically um, works on harmony between science and faith, taking science at face value and saying, no, the science is good, the science is real, we need to um, elevate the scientific process while still being 100% committed to our faith and taking scripture first and everything else. And so what does that look like when, they, when you put them together? And something that they are doing that's extraordinarily interesting um, is last week they had a national conference in Baltimore and they put two people together that you would never expect to see together in the Christian community. Todd Wood and Daryl Falk. And I got to see this conversation, which was great. Uh, Todd Wood is a creation scientist and he absolutely believes that the evidence for evolution for, is there and he knows his science really well. But because of the way he reads the Bible, he says there has to be something more than what the scientific story is telling. So I'm gonna devote my life to trying to find that thing, that non-evolutionary process, even though he doesn't expect to find it in his lifetime. Daryl Falk is a well-known evolutionary biologist. Both of them think the other one is actively harming the church with, their, with the way they do stuff. And in a grand experiment, they have been in deep conversation with each other for the last six years. They just wrote a book about their experiences called The Fool and the Heretic, which one might be the fool, the other one would be the heretic, right, with what they believe. And the amazing and emergent thing about this book that you find is that they began to know each other as brothers in Christ, and that relationship developed, and even though they still can't understand why the other person thinks the way they do, and one, of, and one and the other always secretly hope that the other one will come over to their side, they now really are good friends and have all of these shared common values that they can share with each other. And um, they will do things for each other that they would never do for people otherwise. Um, Todd Wood came to this evolutionary biologist proclaiming conference. He was the only creation scientist there, and he knew it, that he came because his friend asked him to. And so it's just this amazing story, and I feel like just a little bit of a glimpse of what this type of thing might look like. 
this at least within the Christian community. And I'm not saying the Christian community is you know, this giant group of Kumbaya people. Just the various um, denominations that we have, the number of denominations that we have, tells you that we, we tend to bicker among ourselves as well. But seeing this type of conversation and where it can lead, I think is incredibly important. Um, so yeah, if you get a chance, check out The Fool and the Heretic. It's a quick read. It's only been out, I think, for about a month or so. Um, yeah, and I feel like this is just a really great example of where bringing shared commitments and values to the conversation can be transformative. Uh, locally here in Iowa, the Iowa Catholic Conference is tackling the polarizing issue of climate change. Um, I recommend visiting their website to see some specific examples of local action that they're taking, but I did pull a couple of key phrases for their site for us to consider. First, consider the value languages here. So the first statement being, I'm not sure if you can read it back there, care for the earth is not just an Earth Day slogan. It's a requirement of our faith. We're called to protect people and the planet, living our faith in relationship with all of God's creation. So look at the values language there and the pieces of the faith that they're affirming versus parts that they're pushing on and saying, hey, look, we think the Bible says this too, so let's have a conversation about it. Second, economic benefits and the creation of jobs are important but need to be balanced against any consequences to the environment where future generations and we will live. The ethical and moral dimension should not be overlooked. So thinking about what we talked about early, earlier, this is really interesting too because you can see that they're talking to a different group of people in some ways. Economic benefits, creation of jobs, those aren't things that are specifically in the Bible, but they're talking to an audience where that is a priority, right? And this is not a marketing ploy, this is just being able to say, hey, there are trade-offs in this situation, so let's use all of the different types of languages so we get everyone into the conversation and thinking about the things that are important to them and how they can sort out. And so here there's a lot of trade-off language. Also, this is both local and national. There's the Evangelical Environmental Network, because again, thinking about some of our assumptions, we often think religious folks have trouble with science, but evangelicals even more so, right? That's kind of like the pinnacle of independence in Christian thinking. This is directly from their website and part of their uh, another creation care climate change action of this evangelical environmental network. So this part of the pledge says, I pledge to acknowledge that this isn't a liberal issue. We can have a healthy respect for science while embracing our faith and protecting the sanctity of human life on our earthly home. Client science shouldn't be hijacked by political activists. Organizations advocating a conservative, common sense approach to creation care and clean energy are already springing up. Offering programmatic or pragmatic solutions that don't grow government, but rather stimulate the marketplace to invent the new tools and technologies we're going to need to adapt and thrive. So for some of you in the audience, this might be key directly towards you. For other folks, they're like, well, why is that in there? But okay, yeah, I think that's important too. And that's part of having this shared common values piece, is that you say, okay, here's the part I identify, here's the part I'm not so sure about, but I can see how these things could fit, and I wanna have a conversation with people on kind of the other side of this from me and see how we can put it together. So before I end, one other thing that I do strongly want to bring in here is one of my favorite verses from Colossians, Colossians 16, 17. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And so for me, whether you're talking about science and society, polarization, division, ways that we're blowing apart our world or bringing it back together, I think faith elements can help remind us, and our Christianity can remind us, that it's all in one held together, and that is the way that we should try to act. Um, so just kind of wrapping up, there's a few things that I want to note here, make sure that I have this right in my slides too. Um, these issues that we've been talking about in science and society are incredibly complicated, even wicked. How do we in this audience 
move forward, especially since you know you disagree on these stress things, right? Like, there's some crazy people that don't even see things the same way you do. How can you trust them? So what can we do? So let's have some practical homework to move forward with. First, model respectful conversations as much as you can. You might learn more than you think from someone who is clearly on the opposite side of the spectrum on something from you. If you just stop to listen to what they're saying and not already have your argument in mind for what you're going to say back. Second, seek shared values. Start easy. Within this audience, maybe you see things a little bit differently, but you can talk to your neighbor and say, all right, are you a dog person? Are you a cat person? Are you a golf person? Are you a March Madness person? What kind of things can we find that we have simple shared common values that we can geek out about and get excited about and oops, while we did that, now I think of you as a person and not as a position. So now maybe we can work on the other stuff once we've actually become familiar with each other in a different way. And then work harder. What do you value? What do you prioritize? How can you find those things that at the very base, digging down, you all want the same thing? How do you get that to surface? And then what do you do with it? And then finally, love someone who you disagree with, even though it might be one of the hardest things you can do. I'll hazard that, again, you'll be surprised at what emerges from the relationship, just like Todd Wood and Daryl Falk in their book, A Fool and the Heretic. So with that, um, I'm going to end this part of the presentation. And I think that working with each other that way and trying to find those commonalities and realizing that all things come together in Christ is something that we can all agree on, right? We wanted to set that context for a healthy discussion. Uh, the context of what are value, what's values? Where can we find shared values? How can we understand each other as human beings? But that doesn't always address specific questions that you may have. I'm off? I think you're good. I don't you're know. Good? Okay. Um, you were signaling me. Yeah. No, sorry. I was okay. trying to do this. <laughs> it doesn't always address those specific questions that you have. Um, and that may be on issues of evolution, and that may be a scientific question that you want to ask a scientist. It might be a faith question you might want to ask, or on other things that might come up with climate change, or other things that came up in the discussion. So this will be a fairly open opportunity for you to ask questions. So I will summarize that for the sake of that to make sure we got good audio and maybe not everybody heard it. But as a specific example, the debate had on vaccination concerning measles. That there's a certain segment that thinks that there's dangers in these vaccinations and they should not be forced to have their children vaccinated. And others say that for public policy and overall effectiveness of vaccination, everybody has to be vaccinated or a great majority. How in this context and what you presented would you address that? That's actually one of those very sticky, wicked problem questions in a lot of ways, right? Because at the same time as you're trying to build a communal resource and a communal herd immunity to measles, you're also trying to respect the ability of individuals to make decisions about what they put into their or their kids' bodies, right? Um, and so two kind of perspectives that I can provide on that. One, the scientific perspective is that um, vaccinations work incredibly well. They are overwhelmingly safe, but in order for them to work well, you do have to have this thing called herd immunity, where the majority of people need to be vaccinated in order to protect those who either can't receive vaccinations because of physical limitations, or they have age and sickness related issues, right? So everybody else ends up protecting that least or most vulnerable group. Um, and what we're seeing emerging is that when lots of people who have otherwise healthy immune systems are pulling back from that choice to be vaccinated, then there is not enough herd immunity to protect anyone who is unvaccinated. And so the folks who can't have the vaccinations for real medical reasons become sick um, as they are exposed to the disease 
um, by those who have chosen to be unvaccinated. So there's a whole bunch of interconnected things going on there. Um, the other thing is um, the science has shown that these vaccinations are incredibly um, uh, well received by the majority of human beings, right? Most people don't get sick when they get vaccinations. However, medicine has not gotten to the point where it's so specific as to be able to target, say, everyone's individual physiology or targeted to, say, everyone's DNA. That hopefully is coming someday too, but there is the real truth that some people, for various reasons, do react poorly to vaccinations. I'm not going to gloss that over, but the benefits of vaccination so incredibly outweigh the probability of yourself or your kid actually having one of those complications from a vaccination that it ends up coming down to a question of what you prioritize in a lot of ways. Now, from a public policy standpoint, this is a problem because anytime people decide not to be vaccinated and you start having these outbreaks, then you have a public health issue, right? And so the decisions that are made around this are probably going to be a top-down policy type situation and maybe not a bottom-up individual people thinking what they want. We aren't, we aren't probably gonna end up with states that have choices for vaccinations. Um, and it is very unfortunate that we're seeing many of these diseases that have been all but eradicated around the world just popping up because people are making these types of decisions. As far as how to address that from a shared values, that's one of the tougher ones because with my training and experiences, I have a hard time seeing the other side. I would rather personally get a vaccination and take the risk of getting sick with a side effect than having one of those terrible diseases that might kill me or potentially transmitting it to, a, say, an unprotected older relative who could no longer handle the vaccination. So I think the shared values piece might be more around who are you trying to protect and where are your priorities there and really having folks think through that. Um, and if you have someone who you know, really prioritizes one or the other, it's just gotta be one of those shared conversations where for a long period of time, you're just talking together to try to talk it out. And a lot of people who have personal experiences with suddenly getting one of these diseases will say, wait, 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 it's totally worth getting the vaccine, trust me. But I'm just not sure information is flowing the way it needs to be right now. Um, yeah, this isn't one of my better areas to talk about because I'm still kind of confused by why this happens. <laughs> Even though I understand the motivation on both sides. So I'm sorry that wasn't terribly enlightening. Again, my light bulb just dimmed a little bit. Well, but I, I think you pointed out that you have to get at that value of what is the value of the community. I'm not sure I want to call a human community the herd, but right. <laughs> but I understand what you're saying there. But um, but to look at that value of community, and in some ways, valuing community is also individually enriching. Yes. Whereas in valuing the individual self-interest will probably in the long run also damage the individual. I mean, that'd be yeah, part of yeah. the way I'd go at the argument. Potentially, yes. Um, there's also that authority piece in there too. And a lot of the, I would say, more kind of anti-science and concerned groups do tend to be able to self-barricade a little bit with our new advanced ability to find each other that are like-minded on things like social media. And so you can turn yourself and your community into a sounding chamber so that everything you hear reinforces what you want to believe. And that's very insidious. And one of those other reason, reasons why it's so important to find people who disagree with you and keep them around you, keep them in your feed, not so you can defend against them, but so you can understand why they are where they are and how parts of what they've experienced and what they believe could actually enhance your way of understanding. We all have to have the humbleness, the intellectual humbleness to think that we could be wrong. Because I think if we ever don't, and we absolutely insist that we are right on our particular thing, that's, that's pretty scary too. Yes, here. How do you understand the connection between being against vaccination and one's religion? 
Unfortunately, I don't understand that position well. I don't understand. Right? But we've got to ask. We've got to ask. We've got to find out. Um, not just to like market and change their opinion, but in order to really understand what's happening, how this is coming up in the first place, is this a almost a misappropriation of pieces of the Bible that talk about you know saving yourself and being separate from the world and taking that to an extreme versus being in the world and bringing in the king kingdom of God? You know, everybody's able to cherry pick from the Bible, and so that's part of it too. How do you align, what, what does your version of Christianity or religion look like? And how does that align with these other pieces that you believe? And so I'm not sure if any of us have it 100% right. So we kinda, it's good for us to figure out how everybody thinks so that we're able to know what we think and why and be able to articulate that. And in, in my case, I'm not incredibly sure why, because I haven't had those conversations yet. Again, with that anti-vax one, that's not one of my areas. I'm an evolutionary biologist, and so I tend to stick in that area a little bit more. Oh, yes, sorry. I will restate it. I will, <laughs> yes. Uh, I got too, I got question too excited about Dr. that. Dr. Phil's affirming the need for dialogue, but to say in the area of evolution, it seems that the dialogue between Christianity and evolutionary science has hit some terrible road blocks that it cannot overcome, some impasses. Uh, and uh, I was going to also say, uh, BioLogos on their website has a number of brochures addressing some of those issues. And you can choose what one do you think was a big one that you overcame and what one is a big one still out there? Uh, a big one that's still, so one thing I would encourage you if you have not looked, look at the BioLogos website and don't look for their pamphlets necessarily, look for all of the articles that they publish on these things. They have an enormous number, like 300 theologians, scientists, pastors, all working together on these problems and trying to make sure that they're not just like cutting corners or like, well, maybe if we do things this way, this kind of fits. Like there's some really hard, big conversations that are being had and they're amazing because they are not saying, this is the answer, this is the answer. If you do give answers, straight hard answers in science religion questions, you're probably doing it wrong. So um, these are really amazing conversations that are happening. Some, one that I have been really struck by is, um, that kind of changed the way I thought about things, is the work of um, John Walton in his Lost World series, like Lost World of Genesis 1 was the first book, where he actually talked very deeply about the biblical science um, and biblical interpretation science by theologians and biblical experts over the last couple hundred years and some of the conclusions that they've actually come to about how the different areas of scripture, who they were written for, much of the meaning that's supposed to be transcendent through the generations and how kind of mixing those things up can really change your way of the way you view the Bible and kind of what you think it says about science. Um, that type of literature really helped change my mind about that. Something that I think is a huge problem still that lots of people are talking about is the problem of sin. And the problem in sin matches up with death quite often. Is death bad? Is death wrong? Because in an evolutionary history, over 4.5 billion years of the Earth being around and life being around for a very, very long time, at some point very early on, with the advent of anything living, there was death. And that was a natural, normal process. There was also suffering once things were able to realize that they didn't want to die, either consciously or just because of the way genetics are set up. The only way to pass on your genes is to survive and reproduce. And so genetic lineages need to continue through time in order for evolution to work. And so those things need to be reconciled. How could a good God put into play something that requires sin and death? What does that mean theologically? And what kind of death are we talking about? Is natural death evil? Or is spiritual death the worst thing? And which is being referred to where when talked about in the scriptures and philosophically? Um, so that's one that's still very, very challenging. Um, in a lot of ways. 
Just to summarize the comment there, the difficulty of authority plays a big role in what you accept. And when you don't like what a so-called authority says that's different than what you hold, you often can discount it by saying there's ulterior motives or maliciousness involved from that authority and discount it that way. And quite honestly, I think we do that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so how can we address that in kind of your formulation of enhancing the dialogue and discussion? Right. I would just say talk to that authority, talk to that group, learn a little bit more about what they're doing. Um, personal anecdote on the kind of anti-science sentiment that seems to kind of dovetail with what you're talking about. Um, I was at a lecture with another scientist friend recently who is trying to dispel the myth that scientists are up to trouble and just trying to make money and get grants so they can study what they want. So they actually are you know, making claims that really aren't supported or you know, evolution's just this big thing that's got lots of money tied to the research of, so of course we're gonna follow that line you know, wherever it leads. And he actually thinks it's ridiculously funny. Um, I think it's kind of damaging, <laughs> the whole idea of it. But if you ask any scientist if they are do like why they're doing what they're doing, it's because they love doing their work and they are extremely competitive with each other. And if there's any way to prove somebody else wrong, they're gonna try to do it. And so it's not like scientists are in cahoots to try to like bring about a different philosophical thing. They're not trying to, a lot of churched folks think that scientists are actually trying to um, increase the droves of atheism and make like kids leave the church. Like that's just not even within a scientist's purview. They're not interested in that. Um, and so coming back to the authority piece, I think that's also something that we have a unique problem with in the United States in some ways where we think our individual ability to sort through the potential expertise of another person is far more elevated than it is. And so we might be comfortable calling in a plumber because he's an expert, but then when you talk to somebody about their subject material with vaccines, no, 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 they have an agenda because that's not what I wanna believe. And so I think it, some parts of that come back to that intellectual humility where at some point, we do have to believe in some good in some aspects of, humili I mean, of humanity and trust what they're saying. Although, you know, skepticism is good and there are bad people out there and bad motives. So sorting through all of that stuff is really hard. And in the internet age, we become more and more aware that there is a lot of spin and there is a lot of misinformation. And it is kind of our job to try to figure out which sources can I trust. Yeah. So, yeah, so as much as you can, align yourselves and your news with broad organizations that are tasked to do exactly that. So my other scientist friend was just giving advice the other night. If you wanna know what the real scientific deal is on climate change, look at the huge scientific enterprises like the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, those big groups um, they are going to have the consensus society because things are peer reviewed and put out that way. And so that's kind of the best you can do is look for large collectives of people that kind of believe the same thing. And I know that runs counter to Christianity in some ways because you want to be the small group that's different from everybody else. But in my mind, mentally, that's actually kind of the wrong way to think because you should want everybody to be in your in crowd on that side. So. If I can add to that too, it's not always easy, but I, I say at Geneva, one of our, our favorite question is when somebody makes a bold statement, you just ask why. What, what's your evidence behind that? What's your motivation behind that? And deal with it on that asking question as opposed to right away countering. Yeah. Repeat the question about BioLogos and their approach. Are they holding to a specific model of integrating scientific evolutionary change and divine providence, or are there multiple models within that organization? Fair? Yes. BioLogos itself does have a position that they do believe right now that what we have in science as the evolutionary framework is the best science that we have in that area, and predicating that, that our ability to do science is part of a God-given gift, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, 
and strength, right? And so it's actually an ability of ours to investigate the natural world, which also is created by God as a way to understand more about God. And so saying when the science is done really, really well, that should be saying the same thing as God's other word, the scriptures, right? And so right now, they really are in line with the consensus science on evolutionary biology. Um, and with, um, it's, it's hard for me to talk about the different theological models out there, um, but there are a number of those that fit pretty well with that. Not that, I mean, I don't like to say, you know, you pick this model to fit with this model, because that's not really the way it works, nor the way it should be. Um, but BioLogos is very, very open to having all of these conversations with other groups that do think different things. And we want to keep that communication open because that's incredibly important for us, not only as a sounding board, but as a way to make sure that we're doing things that are absolutely elevating the Christian faith as well as the science. Um, so I can't tell you like specifically what that model looks like because even within our group, we all have very little variations on different parts that interest us. Like somebody might be more interested in the human development aspect of it where other people might be more interested in um, looking at uh, deep time and like fossil records and stuff like that. So we all, but we all kind of come around to this convergence and they do have a position on evolutionary biology is the way it went. Now the interesting thing about that though is the evolutionary biology part is a process part. It has nothing to do with the individual instance of origins of life on Earth. There is no theory for that. So that's something that still hasn't really been, been dealt with. Um, and as we know more science, maybe we'll learn more about that, or maybe those are questions that we can't really address at this point. To so. just add a little footnote, when you said, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, mm -hmm. it's interesting that the Hebrew doesn't have mind oh, does in the it? Old Testament. In the Greek, when it's repeated, they add the word mind, Ooh. which is a really interesting thing to me in yeah. terms of the, com the commonality is love the Lord your God. Right, right, right. How right. it's expressed in different cultures huh. comes out differently. Okay. <laughs> See, you learn stuff, new stuff every day. Now I have to go back and rethink that model. Um, I'll so, repeat the question in a minute, though. Oh, just uh, just really make sure we get it clear for, for taping as well and for everyone in the audience here. Uh, is there an organization addressing issues of Christian perspectives on uh, gender and sexuality, which is a huge discussion within the Christian community and unfortunately ripping too many Christian communities apart. Uh, so that's the question. The group that originally put Todd Wood and Daryl Falk together um, and that produced the book, The Fool and the Heretic, there was a little uh, emblem underneath that book that said the Colossian Forum. Um, they are specifically working on divisive issues within churches and so they are producing curriculum, they're having conversations, they're doing all kinds of stuff with not only origins, but they're also working on, um, on sexuality and gender. And I believe they also now are working on a politics type module and group, um, and probably have a few other things that they're working on that I'm not currently aware of. They are also Grand Rapids, Michigan based um, and growing and are having a lot of synergistic conversations with places like uh, BioLogos, with the Gospel Coalition, um, and with a variety of other uh, Christian networks that aren't currently coming to mind. And I think but the they're a really good they're, resource to check out. I think the reason they're called the Colossian Forum is because of yeah. the text you had up there, in Christ all things hold together. Yeah. And how can we hold together and have these discussions? Yeah, and I tend to broaden out a little bit more from them and want to bring the Christian conversation and the values into more of the societal plane, they are very focused right now on how do we heal the division within our churches. And not only how do we like, they're not focused on fixing it and healing it, they're focused on um, despite the division, how can we still grow and move forward and use that division as an opportunity for growth, so. Which is, I think is a great statement of what you're saying in this arena applies to so many other areas as well, is to see conflict or disagreement as an opportunity to learn, to grow, 
with other people. So Mel Slachter, uh, emeritus priest, is that the correct title of the Episcopal Church? I used to work there. Okay. <laughs> Uh, makes a comment that the difficulty of stressing orthodoxy, right doctrine, as opposed to orthopraxy, right practice, and uh, highlighting the, the importance of the contemplative tradition, tradition of listening. Any comments, response? Only comments is you know how many different doctrines are espoused by how many different groups in this like hierarchical set. Like everybody can agree on like the top few, right? Like if you put them up as like, Jesus is Lord, the resurrection happens, stuff no, like that. not everybody's gonna agree there even. Not everybody, but okay. <laughs> I guess it depends how interfaith you wanna be. <laughs> I narrowed in a little bit too much there. But it feels like there's a few things at the top and then there's this like hierarchical nest of different interpretations that come along through there. And doctrine changes, right? It ends up changing over time. Some of it does, not necessarily the big groupings, but some of the stuff down here where people are splitting hairs over when you can be baptized, what that means, when you can have communion, what that means, all of those things like end up being doctrinal pieces that are interpreted in a way that gets down to practice. And I think you're right. I think there definitely needs to be more of a consideration of not how does this one doctrine that we have right now mean that we have to focus in on this like one little narrow practice to do things right. I feel like that's almost a Pharisee-like interpretation, right? We've got this thing, we're absolutely sure of what it is, and we've laid it out, and so we do exactly this thing and forget about everything else. I think you're right. I think there needs to be a lot more exploration into not only what do we need to be doing, even more than what we're thinking, but also to maybe re-expand out a little bit and look at other faith traditions look back at some of the mysticism and say, what pieces have we left out and what is that doing to us as people? I think you're absolutely right. That, however, gets way out of my realm of ability to, to move forward in practical suggestions on. So I'm gonna have to leave that up to someone much more informed like yourself in those areas. I think you had the quotation up there and I think it was one of the people from BioLogos, it's more important to be loving than right. It was kind of the summary of the quotation up there, yes. Yeah. You're pulling stuff out of my talk like you, you know. I paid attention. <laughs> <laughs> it was about listening, right? And, and that's why some of you may come, have come here probably not expecting to get the answer of the Christian perspective on evolution or a lot of these issues that are out there being debated. But realistically, you know, there is not a simple answer. Uh, what we wanted to say is fundamentally is listen, talk, learn, respect, love. Anything else you want to add? Stand with love. So thank you for coming out um, and uh, joining us. And part is a representation that Geneva hopes to come alongside both the church and the university and to help this partnership, this dialogue that we need for the enrichment of our entire community. So thank you for being part of our community here uh, this afternoon, and let's give one final thanks, Dr. Godbeck. <laughs>